Hello. Uh, settle down. Um, I'm Boyd Hill, and more importantly, this is Jay Hunt, Chief Creative Officer of Channel 4. Yes. While you all settle into your seats, some of you latecomers, let, luckily we've got a VT to watch of the highlights of the last year on Channel 4. Let's have a look. healthy round of applause. Um, before we start, actually, let me just say one thing. If you, uh, I am going to try and make time for questions from you guys later, but if the best way to ask a question is to do it through the app. So if, you haven't, if you've got the app, if you haven't got the app, download it, and there's the way to ask questions. They come up on my iPad here, and I'll try and ask some at the end. But let's just say we, we are in a slightly weird position. So you are the longest serving controller of the main channel. You've been here for Am years I? and years. Yeah, you've been here for years and years and years like me, but you've had to face proper questions. But this is your outgoing session. You're last, obviously, as the controller of Channel 4. So that's a bit weird, isn't it? But Well, is it weird? I don't know. I mean, yeah, I've been doing these sessions. I think I worked out the other day for 12 years I've been doing these sessions. Is it weird? I don't know. I mean, I've, I've loved being at Channel 4. I've been incredibly proud to do that job. I mean, reels like that make me well up, actually. I think it's extraordinary what that team have achieved in that time, working with so many extraordinary people in this room today. So, yeah, it's, I suppose, yeah, it's an end of an era. Weird but good. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, we'll talk in detail about you leaving and what that means and everything, and I'm going to try and find okay. out why and how and all of that later. But let's talk about the year. Obviously, a year ago, as we saw in that, you did win Channel of the Year at yeah. the prestigious Edinburgh TV Festival. Yeah, I've heard talk of the event. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but was it hard then, the year, the year since then? Yeah. How do you feel it's gone? What are your highlights? What Any lowlights? How, what, what's your feeling about the year? I think it's been really, really strong here creatively. I think we've had loads of shows that I'm really proud of. I mean, it's interesting looking at that, where we've got to now with drama, which in a sense was the second phase after the big factual renaissance, but to uh, have Born to Kill doing well, no offence now, a big returner for us, Ackley Bridge, you know, several years in the making, but then delivering huge 10 to 14 audiences for us as well. And again, there, you know, you'd see Handmaids there, a show I think by anyone's reckoning, which has been the talked about programme of the summer. Very, very proud of that. Um, again, in factual, I think fantastic to have Diana thrilled with things like mutiny. Great to see Child Genius doing a job as well. So I think, I think we've had a good year. We had a slightly tough first quarter, hand on heart, in terms of performance, but we've been steadily improving since then. And I think we're in a pretty good place now, going into, certainly by my reckoning, the strongest autumn schedule we've ever had. And um, among various um, interesting things that happened over the year, Eden was an interesting thing, wasn't yeah. it? So there was a big publicity splash when it started yeah. as this big experiment, and then it, got, it went very weird, to yeah. say the least. Yeah. What's your feeling about that now, in retrospect? I'm incredibly proud of that show, and I don't know how many people in the room have watched it, but if you haven't watched it, I honestly cannot recommend it highly enough, and that sounds an odd thing to say, but I probably think probably the best way of describing it, it's the best show we've ever made by accident. So, uh, you know, in a sense, if you set up on a big experiment and the whole point is the producer stands back, then you get what you get. And what we got there was, frankly, the closest thing to the real handmaids you could possibly have expected. It showed misogyny, intolerance, a particular type of sort of visceral male behaviour you rarely see on television. So it didn't turn out to be a massive standout hit by any stretch of the imagination. But what it captured in the end was something I don't think I've ever seen on TV. So... If you're going to make these big punts, sometimes they'll be commercial hits, sometimes they'll be creatively very interesting. That was a much smaller show in terms of audience, but a really creatively interesting one. And in terms of you're in charge of More 4 and E4 as well, how are they doing? Was that, and was that, that's an interesting thing that you're in charge of so many of those, um, those programs, on those, all of those shows on those channels. And how have they done in the last year? Yeah, More 4, I think, has been in a pretty good place. I mean, it's, it's tough for digital channels, which have got quite a high repeat rate for obvious reasons. The market's very competitive now, and there's lots of great content you can watch everywhere. But we've had a lot of success on More 4 in, in the past year with factual shows and things like Outlander moving across from Amazon to More 4 also doing a job. Shows about Yorkshire Dales doing great volume for us as well. So that's done well. Um, so, Outlander, e4, you just, so Outlander, you, you took, it'd already been on. Second window, yeah. Second, so it'd already been on Amazon Prime and yeah. everything. It'd also come out on video. It comes to more for when it yeah. still does well. Yeah, and I think, again, you know, really, really interesting lesson, particularly, I think, to everyone in this room where we live in a media bubble and, you know, everyone's got Netflix, everyone's got Amazon or whatever, and you suddenly realise that, you know, frankly, the rest of the world, or certainly the rest of the UK viewing population do not. So this is a show which was a huge marketing priority. Remember the banner in the reception here a couple of years ago for Amazon, I assume, did well for them. But we picked up a second window, and it's done incredibly well for us on More 4 as well. So More 4's in a good place. E4's continued to have a good year, actually. Celebs Go Dating's done very well. Don't Tell the Bride came across and did very well. We picked up a, a couple of uh, successful acquisitions pieces as well, um, like Kevin Can Wait, which drive volume. Shows like the Goldbergs are getting bigger and bigger for us. So that's in a good shape, too. Um, let's get on to the really crucial um, programme, The Great British Bake Off. Ah, oh, yes. You may have heard. I have It's heard. starting on uh, Tuesday, next I know. Tuesday. 
And now, it always was. Yeah. And the t yeah. So that's interesting, isn't it? So the timing of that is interesting. So you knew you had to face you know, the, world, the industry, the TV industry, and all these journalists, um, and me, I mean, I'm, I'm nothing, mm. and talk about Bake Off. And you showed it to journalists on Monday, and everyone wrote their reviews. And it could have gone either way. It could have been a disaster. But it, I think it's fair to say that it isn't, and that the reviews were pretty much pretty good over, overall. I mean, what you, were you surprised? Were you thrilled? Were you nervous? when those first reviews came oh through. Oh my gosh, I mean, I think when you look back at my tenure at most channels, it's been a bit no guts, no glory. And honestly, I think with these things, uh, you know, Love Productions has done an amazing job with that show. Kelly and Sarah Lazenby, who've worked on it from my side as well, have done an extraordinary job. I'm incredibly proud of the show. It's a fantastic show. I mean, is it a dream outcome to see it getting five reviews in the tabloids? Yes, absolutely it is. Uh, to see a piece in the Telegraph last night saying five reasons why it's better than the show was on the BBC is a pretty extraordinary place to have got to. So, but that's a hard job, you know, a lot of hard work has gone into getting it to where it is. And I'm thrilled it's landed creatively as well as it has. And you know, now we'll see what it does in terms of performance. And even the Daily Mail, as you say, which has been, you, you've been like public yeah. enemy number one for daring to... No, no, to they steal. definitely hate more people than me. It's not okay. just me, yeah. yeah. One, OK. Yeah, 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 even they yeah. liked it. So that must, yeah. that must be incredibly gratifying. But my, I guess it's still the point, isn't it? And everyone's... Uh, I, I watched it and I thought, I thought it was, and really enjoyed it as well. Why did you say that in hushed tones, boy? Do you embarrass to own that? I'm a huge Sue okay, fan. Fine. <laughs> you know, I'm still missing Melvin Sue, I have to say. Anyway, but going back to that moment where you, you made the decision to spend £75 million on this thing, I don't know if you saw BBC News last night, you were probably too busy having your channel for dinner, but Michael Grave was on saying yeah. he thought that was a bad thing for the channel to do, yeah. not what you should be doing. How, how do you react now about your decision to do that? And do you have any qualms about it? Do you have any regrets? How, what's your feeling? Well, I think just on the Michael Grave thing, which I'm afraid his interventions I do find slightly comedic because, you know, in the end, Bake Off is the epitome of the cross-subsidy model on Channel 4, and there's a very clear articulation of it at the moment on the channel. I hope some of you are watching The State. Couldn't be more proud of it. I think it's an exceptional series that Peter Kosminski has delivered for us. They are not big ratings plays, and something needs to pay for big drama plays like that, and Bake Off is part of that cross-subsidy strategy. Michael Grade understands that only too well. During his time, they had a record high, I think, in terms of the number of acquired series in the schedule. And in the olden days, a lot of people in this room will remember that. American shows did exactly the same job. They got the money through the door to pay for the public service delivery. So I make no apology for us operating a cross-subsidy model. That's how Channel 4 works, so that's fine. Um, in terms of the broader play, am I happy with where we've ended up with Bake Off? Yes, absolutely. It's, it's a big show uh, that Love Productions were no longer prepared to make for the BBC after an increasingly acrimonious relationship. And, and in that context, I think it was completely legitimate for Channel 4 to join lots of people who were talking about whether they could offer the show a new home. Uh, and I'm really excited about it launching. So in terms of um, almost like the morality of it, the idea of nabbing uh, your, your rival free-to-air channels, or free, the biggest free-to-air channels, biggest show, and putting it on your show, you, don't, you didn't have any... At the time, you thought, no, I'm going to do this at this time. But this, this language of nabbing and poaching, I think, is really, really critical here. So, you know, I still spent most of my career at the BBC. I care passionately about the BBC. I care a lot about the people who are still working there. So I'm not in the business of going and raiding the BBC. Where that had got to, and again, you know, I've gone over this many times, but it's probably worth restating. A lot of you will remember, it was widely reported in the papers that Love and the BBC had reached an impasse, that they could not make the show anymore. So the scenario was very stark. Bake Off no longer had a home. At that point, all and sundry were interested. Of course they were in the biggest show on television. And I think at that point, it's a totally legitimate conversation for us to be having. And at the time, the other thing that everyone said, when the talent, apart from Paul, of course, Paul Hollywood, when the rest of the talent didn't come, everyone said you'd effectively bought a tent. Yeah. Um, what was, what, were you nervous about that fact that the talent hadn't come? And also, second part of this question is, Noel Fielding, I think, was probably the most surprising yeah. of the new cast. Was that a really difficult thing to do? And, and, and did, were you certain from the start that that was going to work? You know, most of you know my background, it's in news via popular factual, so I think I hope I have good antennae for very strong formats, and actually, and I think it's borne out by how well received Bake Off's been so far, it's an extraordinarily strong format that had travelled very, very well. So, you know, what we were buying was a very strong show. At that point, it was clear we were going to need to reinvent it, and, you know, some of the very generous reviews we've had uh, at the beginning of this week were encouraging because they pointed out that shows like that need regeneration. They, they need different sorts of tones coming into them to keep them fresh. And I think that's what the Channel 4 intervention on this occasion has done. Does it need to get a, a kind oh, of... Oh, you asked about Noel. Uh, um, oh, yeah, Noel, yeah, absolutely. Noel, um, I... It was me that suggested Noel. Oh, was it? Um, I... And it goes back a long way, actually, to a little show that we did for E4 called Luxury Comedy, uh, which some of you, I doubt any of you watched, but it was a sort of primary colours, trippy experience. 
and the comedy team got this lovely letter from a seven-year-old girl saying that she wasn't allowed to watch it with the sound up, but she was allowed to watch it with the sound down, and she absolutely adored it. And I remember it really, I mean, that's years ago now, and it really stayed with me that he has the ability to communicate with children as well. There's something quite childlike in, in the way that he comes across. Um, and I thought he would be an interesting flavour in the mix. And, and I, I hope you enjoy it when you see it, but something rather magical has happened with Sandy and Noel, and, you know, that's as much luck as judgment. You can't, you can't in any way uh, force those sorts of situations, but there's a rather charming dynamic that's emerging, and I, I think they're going to be a pairing to watch. Do you need it to get a certain number of viewers? What should, you, you, you know, on Wednesday, you're going to be, you know, devastated if it gets, I don't know, Five, six, seven. Do you, do you have, have you got any figure in if your mind? If it gets five, six, seven, then I will be ex absolutely delighted. Okay. I mean, you know, I think we've been very clear. This show is break even for Channel Four at around three million. So, you know, anything north of that would be fantastic. Let's move on to the wider world of entertainment. Yeah. Um, I guess for, it, just, it feels like for me that entertainment coming up with new entertainment formats is possibly the hardest thing to do on mainstream yeah. big TV channels. Um, and you revived Crystal Maze, yeah. for example, and everyone's reviving other formats. But it, 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 was that a success? And is that the easiest way to go? Would you, you know, are you, have you, is, there, is there a lack of new entertainment formats on the channel? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I can't sit there and say we've got 15 great new entertainment shows that have travelled internationally. We, ha we can say that in factual entertainment, we can't say that in entertainment. I think, and I've said this many times in, in this forum, I think it's been pretty moribund as a genre for a long time. I don't look across the rest of the networks and say I'd give my back teeth for insert name of show. It, it's just been a bit lacklustre for a while. So I think at a time of, of economic downturn and, and global anxiety, people are very comforted by nostalgia. And the trick for Channel 4 is you've got to have a very small number of shows you can do that with because we're there to innovate and drive things that are exciting and new. But I think the introduction of Rich Diawadi into, into Crystal Maze has been rather charming, actually. He's got a fantastic tone of voice that's really brought it back for a whole new audience. It's delivered very well for us. So I do think with Four, it's a much harder decision than it is on a heritage channel like BBC One because we need to be careful. But when we get it right, they're very successful in the mix. Again, Richard Ardy was an unusual choice, I think, to host that show. Maybe it's, well, yes that... and no, but I think, you know, Travel Man is one of the shows I'm proudest of on the channel. I think to have found a shtick that he can have in a programme like that and to reimagine holiday programming, which frankly is now defunct on mainstream television, doesn't really work anywhere, but it does work on Channel 4 because of his sort of anti-hero shtick. Um, I think it was a natural idea to move him sideways into that space and he's excelled in it. In terms of the bigger picture of Channel 4 itself as an institution, if you like, there was a story earlier this year that the, the idea of moving it to Birmingham... Um, was that how? What was your feeling about that? Honestly, does that contribute at all to your, you know, your wider decision making? What did you? Well, um, you know, I think I said at the time I was one of the only people at Channel Four who'd actually worked in Birmingham. So, um, you know, I, th this is a debate which is clearly going to run and run. Channel Four is engaged with com in conversations with the government around the consultation as to as to what will happen next. And I think our position is quite clear. I don't think there's a massive appetite for complete relocation. I've attended briefing sessions with people in this room actually, get hearing from the indie community about what they want, mm -hmm. and what I took away from that is frankly money talks more than location but you know there may well be a, a compromise solution to all of this it, it won't now be for me to be involved in do, do you think it's, it's a slightly odd idea that to move you know physically a channel to to somewhere like birmingham solves all those problems you know if you like about nations and regions or is it is it much more important um, for you to go around and, 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 and actually get programs from those people and meet those people rather than just physically moving your channel. Yeah, well, I think one of the things I'm, I'm proud of it for, when I got there, I tried to break up that idea of a closed shop. And I mean, I can see Indies sitting in this room who got their first break at Channel 4 when I was there. And part of that was about saying, just because you're new, just because you've not made stuff before, before just because you're not from London, you're a part of a super indie, doesn't mean you can't make programs. And I, one of the most moving things when I resigned was, was being inundated by lots of lovely emails, but particularly from people who said, you gave us a break. And I think it is about money, it is about opportunity and chance. And, and in many respects, that matters a great deal more than where people are physically located. And you did go around, didn't you, meeting um, um, people in the... In the it was always funny, people use that in the past tense. I mean, I suspect that certainly in the indie community, there's no one in this room who hasn't attended a briefing that I've been at so, at some point in the country. I, I started at what amount to nearly seven years ago now, and I just kept going. So every year I still attend briefings all the way around the UK. You have had a bit of an exodus um, in terms of your commissioning team. Neris Evans and Amy Flanagan and Leon Humphreys and Phil Cogg, a lot of people moving. And I know, you, it, you, I mean, it was a great team. And how did it feel to have that split up so much and also for them, some of them to be poached by rival channels and stuff? How have you dealt with that kind of issue? In the end, and I, I'm sure you've all lived through these moments in your career, I think there's a particular team that were together for the turnaround of Channel 4. I mean, some of you will have been in my session in 2013, which felt like it was perilously close to being public execution, actually. It's one I hosted as well. Yeah, I think you hosted that one. 
know, so I'm like, all right, come on, love, you're going to fix it. Um, and then the channel began to turn around. And the people who lived through that with me, uh, many of them, I think, will be friends forever. Um, but that was a particular moment. And you live through those. And I, I think I've said this last year, you could almost hear the commissioning floor exhale when we began to get the critical recognition and the awards and the revenue and blah, blah, blah. And at that moment, I think it's natural for people to move on. I mean, the most thrilling thing for me is they all walked out of the building with substantial price tags on their head because they've been part of a very successful creative tenure. So, you know, they've gone on to do great things, and that's thrilling. Um, uh, in, in terms of the channel's relations to, to, you know, these huge giants like Netflix and, uh, and Amazon Prime, you, you, you did get understandably irritated by the Black Mirror situation when Netflix got Black Mirror. But now you're, you seem to be working more and more with those, those, these new services. Is that the future? I think I was talking to the guys at the network this morning about this. I think this is the big conundrum for channels like Channel 4 going forward. I mean, right now we have a series of hugely successful partnerships with SVOD players, our big Philip K. Dick series. Electric Dreams will launch um, in collaboration with and co-production with Amazon. We've got two or three drama series with Netflix. You know, in the end, there are big players coming in saying, we like what you do. We want that some of that taste palette in, in our service, and that's fantastic. But over time, you have to think about where the brand attribution sits on all of this. And I think it becomes a more complicated conversation. As those players want to have their own content, their own originals, how does that co-production conversation evolve? And, and I, I honestly feel for everyone in this room that we're moving into a phase when you're not going to need to just be great creatives. You're going to be, need to be great creative entrepreneurs and deal makers. And, and that's going to be a fascinating new phase of the way we work. Uh, let's talk about your individual situation. <laughs> You are leaving. My individual situation. Your individual situation, as I'm calling it. Um, why, why are you leaving? Well, to be completely blunt, it's all David's fault. I mean, um, no, so... Uh, David on, Abraham. And honestly, well. you know, we've worked incredibly closely together, and, and I've loved working with him. And the moment he decided to go, then, as far as I was concerned, there were only two options. I was either going to go for his job or I was going to resign. I've always been absolutely clear that that was a very powerful relationship creatively for me and I didn't have any interest in forming a new relationship with a new chief executive. You know, and every year I come here, everyone goes, are you still there? Jeez. You know, so at some point you have to know it's time to go and do other things. And uh, are you going to give us any clues to what you're going to be doing? No, you but, you know, I'm not going to be retraining as a dry cleaner. Um, <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be staying in telly. I've been very fortunate to have a number of offers to stay on the buying side and to move on to the selling side and I'm just trying to weigh out what's best. And there's a story that Alex Mann's first decision is to, is to change the, the title from Chief Creative Officer to Director of Programs. What did you think of that? I mean, <laughs> Not bothered? In a, well, in a nice possible way, it's slightly meaningless, isn't it? I don't, I mean, they're both exactly the same job, aren't they? I mean, I've right. read the job description, and unless something you know, is buried in the, in the detail of it, it's exactly the same job. If that's her preference for the title, that's absolutely fine. I think the job remains exactly the same. To be honest, Chief Creative Officer, I've always thought sounded like prison officer anyway, so, I mean, good luck. I think that's fine. It's quite hard to say as well. Yeah, it's really hard Chief to say. Chief Creative <laughs> Officer. And do you have any inkling as to who's going to be, you know, when you, when you leave, which is quite soon, who's going to be in charge? Who should people send their commissioning ideas to? And... Do you mean in the immediate aftermath yeah. of me going? Yeah, so in the immediate aftermath of me going, Ralph will be stepping up as oh, okay. Deputy Chief Creative Ralph Officer, Lee. yeah. Um, and then I think the process is underway now, isn't it, in terms of appointing a successor, and I don't know what the time frame will be for okay. that. So Ralph Lee is happy to accept all um, emails Any and Any old submissions. rubbish you've got, send it to Ralph, that's the thing. <laughs> Excellent. Now, if you're wondering why we've got this lavish setup of these sofas here, we have got more guests. So we're going to meet some of your new commissioning team, effectively. No, well, no, they've, they've been, been there a long ages, time, but, yeah. Yeah, but they're now in even bigger positions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So please... They're let's, homegrown, homegrown. Right, nice, homegrown, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Let's welcome the head of comedy, Fiona McDermott, head of specialist factual, John Hay, and head of drama, Beth Willis. Join us. This is an exciting new innovation of the controller sessions this year, by the way, if you're wondering. If they're all going to have ring a cast of, uh, of lovely people working on the channel. Um, let's start with you, Fiona, and, and um, comedy. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to show a clip of you've yes. picked a specific show for your upcoming slate. Well, I've picked three, actually. Picked three, indeed. Yeah, you've got a little um, bit of a, a, uh, a real. So let's have a look, and then we'll talk, should we talk afterwards yes. about why you picked these? Yeah, yeah, great. Let's three shows, three upcoming shows. Good to get actual laughter from the audience watching know, comedy clips. Thank that's, you, guys. That's, that's good, that's isn't kind it? Yeah. Of you. So, Lee and Dean, the middle one, I believe, was your yes. first commission, is that right? Yeah, so, that, yeah. so, um, yeah, so we've been working with them for a while, Miles and Mark, who are Bingo Productions, and they are actually a really good example of how we work best. Because to get those guys who 
were, are sort of the full package. They are the writer performers, they produce, they direct, they put stuff online and they sort of pitch to us and we end up giving them a blap and that blap turned into a pilot and that pilot's now gone to a full series. So the blap of the things, the little shorts on, there are all short online, online things that we've yeah. done for a few years now, and they've and they've turned. We've had a good few series from them actually, so they've been really successful for us. And, and Lee and Dean's the latest. And um, to grow from that to a series with a really small regional indie is like a massive success for us. They're brilliantly funny. They're just exactly the sort of type of people that adore working with because every ounce of them wants to make that, and so it's a privilege to do it with them. And it's. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful bromance, you'll see as it evolves, that it's these two guys who've got this really terrible building firm and they have this unrequited love story at the heart of it and it's, it's surprising in lots of ways. It's, ador it's an adorable show. And bringing back Mitchell and Webb, obviously people yeah. show one of the great Channel 4 triumphs. With Simon Blackwell, it's like the dream. It's brilliant, that show. I mean, I'm, I'm so excited. I think it's, it's in the vein of... The stuff, how Catastrophe works so well for us is it's got this lovely narrative that drives it so episodically, it's glorious and it's so tight and you get the satisfaction sort of every half hour, but it has this big story that drives it and back is actually in that model um, that there is this brilliant tension that David thinks Stephen's come back, Robert's come back to steal his quite shit life and everyone's like, no really they haven't, so there's this brilliant paranoia that drives it all the way through. Um, it's very funny and they're absolutely at their best in it, it's great to have them back. I, I'm, I'm lucky I've got time to ask you this question because I'm a huge fan of Michaela Cole yep. and Chewing Gum and it has been reported it's not coming back. Was that a mutual decision? What, what went on? What happened? Do you know what? I don't think there's any grand thing about it. She'd done two exceptional series and she's, it's heart and soul for her to pour that out of yourself the way she did with that. It's, there's a natural respite, I think, that she needed and she, she's a star i mean she's doing stuff everywhere so it's there is no we're not working with michaela we're just not doing more chewing, chewing gum at the minute and i think the conversation will probably end up being what do you want to do next is it a more grown-up piece is it something we'll do on channel four she's so clever she's got so much to say that it's there's never say never we'd always want to work with her and fun, as you're putting your team together, your comedy team at Channel 4, is, can you sum up what you're looking for? Is it, I mean, it's a hard question, but that's um, what people want to know. It's sort of... It, we don't make a lot as a genre. You know, like we, no, we don't have hundreds of series a year. So we make about seven, to ten, seven shows, I'd say, for Channel 4 a year-ish, yep. and three for E4. So it's sort of a blessing and a curse in the sense that the biggest thing we want is something that's not like anything else, and which means we have to cast our net really wide to do that. So at the minute, I think it's a big diversity of voices is what we really, really want to champion. So Derry Girls being an example of a really, really ambitious national piece that is totally Channel 4 at heart because it, it, I mean, it is, the backdrop is the troubles, but it has this sort of really funny gang show at the heart of it, domestic comedy. That's great, but what's the next bit? What will a comedy look like in Britain in the next two or three years as we negotiate Brexit. There's a really brilliant tension in that across the country and I think if you're gonna nail that at a channel, it should be channel four and that's a big ask for us. So strong authored pieces always, stuff that you wouldn't get anywhere else, narratives and regional diversity of voice I think are the big takeouts. That's pretty good, yeah, yeah. thank you. Pleasure. John, we've got a wonderful clip. From yeah, you, just, one you show from you. just one show from you. But I really like it. Yes. <laughs> Let, before, let's, before we discuss it, let's, let's have a look at this extraordinary clip. So why, John, why are these people moving a model train <laughs> around the country? I, I should say that's the um, biggest little railway in the world from Loft right. Productions. Um, I, I actually asked that question when it came in, because it is obviously a hilarious and ridiculous and brilliant thing to do, but there was a sort of, there was a bit of a, well, we're going to do something this big, but it's got to be a purpose. Yeah. But of course, it's a totally brilliant way of doing Victorian railway history and engineering in a very, very Channel 4 way, because that's been sort of the defining feature of our specialist faction in the last few years, has been to sort of embark upon these crazy sort of audacious enterprises, you know, so we might you know, do 4,000 miles across the Pacific in an open boat for mutiny, or recreate SAS selection, or crash a plane, or mummify a taxi driver, or circle the earth, or dissect an elephant. And I sort of felt like, I mean, that, we basically, we want, that's our style. We want action-based films, not script-based films. We try and find the history or the science in, in amongst the action, rather than sort of having someone walking around saying facts. Um, and I, I sort of felt like in recent years, if you think of uh, SAS Who Dares Wins and Leveson Woods Walks, and some of Guy Martin's sort of terrifying challenges. We found scale in, a, in quite a sort of male, extreme, often a bit sort of dark um, way. 
And what this offered was a chance to get to that same sort of scale, but in a sort of joyous and eccentric and inclusive way. I mean, you don't have to be muscle-bound and sort of fearless to do it, which is obviously nice for me. And I just think we need to sort of broaden our tone a bit, and it's part of that broadening of the tone of the, of the department. So this came as a, they pitched it to you, and this is, this is what we're going to do, and you were like, oh, OK. Yeah, well, yeah, because sort of like, Jay knows the story, right? <laughs> Basically, they pitched it to, they mentioned it to Jay, Jay funded it to me. I was like a bit on the fence. Rob Coldstream, actually, who's the history commissioner in my department, um, came into a commissioning routine brandishing a large piece of track, right? And sort of said, look, you're, you're you know, what, what do you mean, what's the purpose? The purpose is we're going to tell the whole story of the Victoria Railway Age. Like, oh, that's quite a big purpose, you know? So, and as it sort of evolved, you realise that everything they hit, they're going to have to face the same challenge. That, that viaduct is an amazing piece of work. I mean, yeah, you can tell the right. story of the engineering to be able to do it. So... Can you, uh, yeah. Yeah. Can you give us example, a few other examples of, of, of things that you, you want to go down that kind of route? Any, any particular examples of stuff you've got coming up you can tell us about? Yeah, I mean, I suppose the others, I mean, we're obviously continuing with uh, all of those big um, returners that we're doing. We've got, um, but the trick of it, as ever, is to sort of, you know, extend into new areas. So, so you've got a lot of hit returners. Yeah, we have. And it's, that's, I mean, that's been a sort of, that's been a big job of work by everyone uh, in, in, in the team. But we've got um, Secret Life of... Uh, four and five year olds filming at the moment. Um, Levis Woods' new series is on. He's been going to new places and opening up less well known parts of the world, which is really exciting. We've got um, SAS coming back. SAS Who Does Wins, New Country. Um, Guy Martin's preparing various things that are going to turn my hair grey. Um, Grayson Perry, as we speak, is on his way from an Indonesian uh, death ceremony to an Indonesian birth ceremony in the sort of remote part of Indonesia. Um, and I suppose the other sort of, the, 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 the other in, in, in broadening the tone, the other thing we're doing is we're sort of slightly shifting in a slightly more topical direction with some of the stuff we're doing. So we've got a big series coming up in the autumn about the channel, um, busiest waterway in the world. It's a sort of how it works series, but against the backdrop of Brexit, it just sounds like an interesting time to do that kind of Dorling Kinsley thing, but to do it with everyone who's sort of trying to work out what's going to happen to their lives and livelihoods. Um, we've got a um, big series coming through next year called A Year of British Murder, which is a sort of audit of all the murders in this country in one year. But um, using that, and it's being made very beautifully as observational documentary by Ben Anthony um, and by Arrow, uh, and that is, that is being used as a way of casting a lens on ourselves. And we've got a big four-parter which sort of basically tells the story of modern America through the person of Donald Trump. So I think there are ways... I mean, in a, we will always want that kind of... Um, uh, the, the audacious enterprise, but we're trying to sort of broaden the range of what we do and also broaden the range of talent we work with. What's top of your list of, of things you're looking for? So, I mean, talent, absolutely top of the list. Uh, it's kind of interesting, about three quarters of our stuff doesn't have a presenter, which is sort of unusual in special mm. action, but where we do, I mean, look, I realise looking at the room here, it's the easiest thing for me to say, hardest thing to find, especially when it's Channel 4 talent, because, you know, we want people who aren't professional presenters, we want strong personalities who are right in the middle of the story, uh, and that's, that is hard to find, but when you hit upon a sort of you know, one of those are brilliant, idiosyncratic, passionate people like a Guy Martin or a Grayson Perry. You, you can see, I mean, both for the production company they're working with and for us, it opens up massive amounts of new road. Uh, and I think we need to broaden the range of people we've got. That's really important for us. And I think the tech, second thing is, is that, that topicality that I was mentioning. I mean, we're not current affairs, but we, we're a young channel. And if we, if we aren't talking about what people are currently bothered about, why would you watch, you know? So... Mm. I think we've got a real role to play, sort of offering perspective through the particular sort of expertise of all our different factual specialisms yeah. um, in sort of holding the world up scrutiny. So, brilliant. Thank both you. Both of those things. Let's move on to drama. Beth, um, you've picked one show as well, yes. I believe, called Kiri. Yeah. And let's have a look at the clip first, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Let's have a look. absolutely phenomenal yeah. in it and uh, that's written by Jack Thorne. Now Jack Thorne must be the busiest m dramatist <laughs> in the world. He is, he is uh, and he's you know just one of the most wonderful he just you know is able it's a four-parter about Sarah Lancashire plays a social worker who does what she thinks is the right thing and something tragic occurs and, and the fallout from the press and the public and uh, and social services um, that follows and She's, she's just spellbinding, and Jack's writing is so gripping and so uncompromising. Uh, it, it's, it's an extraordinary watch. And that's a four-parter, am, am yes. I right? And at the moment, you've got the state 
to yes. carry on at the moment, which is a full part as well. Is this a trend as we look at kind of... Well, I think it's, it's not like the whole story at all. We need a variety of things. We need returning series on no offences and our humans. We need our big electric dreams, our Bo Willimon series, the first um, big co-producible, um, grand, ambitious ideas. Um, but I think there's a lot to be said for those kind of mini binges, you know, people are kind of don't have that much time and if you can consume a whole story in four hours, then that's kind of very digestible and I think on a practical front, you get extraordinary talent willing to commit themselves for quite a short period of time. Jack is the busiest man alive, but he wanted to tell this one story. He doesn't want to faff around with the returning series. He wants to write four hours of one story. And Sarah Lancashire, before doing a play that she's about to start in, was able to commit to playing this extraordinary character over four hours. So I think, you know, in this competitive landscape, being able to do those kind of things is quite exciting. And are you looking for contemporary, edgy stories? I guess the state, which, which I think the Daily Mail called a recruiting video for ISIS or something. How, first of all, how would you respond to that? Well, I would respond by saying that isn't what everybody else has said, and the Daily Mail also gave it, you know, pick of the week. So, uh, you know, the Telegraph called it eye-opening and exactly what Channel 4 should be doing, so I would... I hope that's slightly more accurate. But is that, is that representative? Are you looking for modern, contemporary, current stories, the kind of hard-hitting need, kind of... Yeah. I, I, think, I think that we need to um, be telling contemporary stories that, that reflect our world back at us, but um, that, that doesn't mean homework television. You know, right. we want to make dramas that people can absolutely lose themselves in. Um, um, you know, we want producers to be fearless and, and writers to be fearless in the ideas they bring us, but keep an eye on why an audience would want to watch something. Uh, I mean, I think National Treasure is a, a perfect example of, you know, Jack, again, writing, writing in his extraordinary way, Mark Munden, and, you know, directed it in, in an extraordinarily cinematic way. But The Forge, the producers, always knew that, you know, whether you're a Guardian reader or a Daily Mail reader, you were fascinated by what happened behind closed doors in Rolf Harris's house before he walked into court holding hands with his family. And, you know, those three ingredients coming together worked brilliantly because it was an important story, but we felt sure that people were interested in it. And you mentioned uh, Electric Dreams, which is this extraordinarily ambitious <laughs> ten single stories adapted from Philip K. Dick yes. stories. It feels to me, I'm, I, everyone's going to say this, I'm sorry, it's going to feel like the new Black Mirror. Is that fair? Well, obviously there are elements in Black, of Black Mirror in it, but they're, they're such different stories. And you know, each one has been written by an extraordinary writer with, a, with I mean, a mind-boggling cast. When I try and tell people who's in it, I just lose track halfway through because there are so many famous people. They're just kind of falling all over the place. Um, extraordinary list of directors all telling their own unique stories. So obviously they're all adapted from Philip K. Dick's stories, so they're, they're, they're are linking themes, but they feel very different. Thank you. And I've seen a couple of them, and they are, they are pretty amazing, I have to say. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to slightly rude to say goodbye to the additional commissioning team. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Fiona, John and Beth. Hey, there we go. No, yeah, you're going to miss them. Yeah, I miss them, yeah. I quite like them being here. It's um, good. Because it's time to focus back onto you and oh, your legacy no. at Channel 4. Um, there's a lot to dis discuss. I want to talk about the, your, your highlights and all of that. Um, there was a thing in broadcast, I think, the current issue of broadcast, talking about your kind of personal mm -hmm. style and saying you got heavily involved in all decision making. Micromanagement was a word that you used. How, how do you feel that's fair? And you know, how do you feel about you know? I just kind of I, I just sort of got to the point where I just laugh about it. To be honest, boy, because the bit that I find genuinely hilarious is we have introduced a way of working at Channel Four, which is unique in world broadcasting, I think, where, I mean, a very good example, because of the creative breakfast system, which all of you know about now, the decision to buy The Handmaid's Tale wasn't made by me, it was made by me, involving every single head of department that I have. Lee and Dean, you just heard about it there, has probably been seen by 80 people when it came in as a blab, including people from marketing, from sales, from HR. So, in the end, we have created, I think, the most inclusive commissioning system in the world. And I know that because I'm now approached by international broadcasters and I've actually had to write a sort of little Bible <laughs> to send out about how we broke down the silos and how we work in a different sort of way. And also, you know, I think I've, they've just done a great job and I think they're a fantastic team. And in the end, great creative people don't stay in environments when they're disempowered. They stay where they feel part of a collective vision and they want to deliver something exceptional. So, you know, 
I stand by my track record. I think we've had an incredibly good run. I've got an amazing team I'm very proud to have worked with, and, you know, I think that is a legacy. And is it partly because, it seems fair enough, you're, you're passionate. This channel, you've been involved with for years now, and you're passionate about it. I mean, you would want to get involved, wouldn't you? In, 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 yeah, but also, I mean, I think people forget. I mean, I can see the chairman sitting in the second row slightly disconcerting me. But, you know, you know, in the end, I'm held to account by the chairman and right. the board. You know, I have a responsibility to be able to sit there at a board meeting when Charles says to me, what's gone on with the state, Jay, and say, I've seen all four episodes, Charles. This is what happens, and this is how I think it's going to land, and work with the press and marketing team. So I have a, a, a literal responsibility to do that. But also, yes, I mean... This job, when I came in, was about turning around a channel that had, you know, the development pipeline had dried up. You know the story, you know, Big Brother wasn't there. We had to totally rebuild the channel mm -hmm. and go from that schizophrenia of big commercial shows supporting public service to where I think we are now, which is this extraordinary collection of shows that have become global successes for people in this room that have reunited those two things. Great public service television that speaks to people about the big themes of the day, but also delivers mass audiences. And you know, right up to the moment I walk out the door, things like Old People's Home for Four-Year-Olds, extraordinary show, which I know will now sell well for CPL, very well done to them, but that's just another one that's added to the list. So, Pick out some more highlights. What, what were the ones you were really proud of? I mean, the ones I'm proudest of, and it probably is the No Guts, No Glory approach in my style, are the ones that everyone said wouldn't work. I mean, it's, it's you know, being told not to bring back first dates because it was never going to get there, looking at goal box and thinking, well, am I brave enough to move a show that's barely doing, you know, over a million to an incredibly exposed shot slot on nine o'clock on a Friday. Humans, I mean, everyone in drama will tell you sci-fi, very difficult to get mass audiences to, hitting the moment with a superb marketing campaign so that we got a mass audience to a big drama like that. So it's always the ones uh, that have been the bravest calls, which I think are the most fulfilling. And I, I think I've felt that always in my career. What's the hardest decision you've had to make for Channel 4? Well, I mean, to be honest, it's almost comical what the past two weeks have been like, if you think about it. I mean, I was you know, in Wales at the top of a hill surrounded by sheep with no Wi-Fi, no phone signal, trying to work out, do we screen the state in the aftermath of the Barcelona attack? What is our defence for the Diana film? How are we going to deal with Bake Off? I mean, the nature of this job, and one of the things that's extraordinary about it is you want to be out there challenging authority and being iconoclastic in the way that you approach things, but with that comes a whole series of almost daily very difficult decisions. Do you think you have made any mistakes? Is there anything you look back on you think? Oh my God, yeah, of course. But, th but then, you know, I think, and I've talked about this again on this platform, we have a terrible tendency as an industry to say, well, you did that and it didn't work in a sort of, you know, mm. when did you stop beating your wife type mm. way. Um, and yet, in the end, the greatest successes we've all had have been about taking huge risks. So, you know, to be honest, I think particularly at Channel 4, if you're not failing quite a lot, you're probably not trying terribly hard because you've got to be out there. And we've got, I mean, you probably see, in fact, I very much doubt you have. We've got a show called Cheap, Cheap, Cheap on air at the moment, which Noel Edmonds said to me is going to be the biggest hit ever. And I said to him, Noel, it is either the worst thing we have ever put out or the best thing we've ever put out. And I don't really know to this day. And yet I couldn't be more proud of the fact we're doing something insane and impossible to sort of understand in the heart of daytime. And you just have to keep trying, don't you? So, I, I love Cheek Cheek Well, there we are. So we found a fan. So I that's may be it. the only person who does it. <laughs> I may be the only person who does. Um, I'm going to get to some questions from the audience in a second. Um, so, I mean, you mentioned those controversial shows, the Diana show, the state right running at the moment, has, has, as I mentioned, Daily Mail action. I mean, do you feel in a way Channel 4 should be on the front page of the Daily Mail? A lot well, of definitely, I mean, you know, poor James McLeod just sat there and seen me through so many of these events and start saying things he doesn't agree with now. But, you know, to be blunt, when you're on the BBC and you're on the front page of the Daily Mail, I know what happens. That's kind of war cabinet time. When you're on Channel 4 and you're on the front page of the Daily Mail, I cut it out and stick it on the wall. And, that, and that's the difference. And I hope it is always like that because it is so vital in broadcast Broadcasting. There's a channel that continues to be fearless and to make shows that feel beyond where other broadcasters will go. And before I get to some audience questions, what has been your single favourite moment at Channel 4 and your time at Channel 4? Weirdly, it's a tiny, tiny little episode, and uh, in fact, Richard Brent, I can see sitting there, will all bear me out on this. We went to the Para Athletics a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. Um, we had it on Channel 4, didn't get huge audiences, although I thought the coverage was fantastic. And there was a mum there with a disabled child. And the kid was bowled over with excitement because they turned up to see Johnny Peacock. Now, for that child, that was an absolutely life-changing moment. And Johnny Peacock is a household name partly because of Channel 4. And that is an extraordinary thing that this channel has done, that it has genuinely transformed the way people think about disability and about Paralympic sport. And I, I think moments like that really do remind everyone that we reach into people's rooms and you know, can talk to them in their, in their front room about interesting issues of the day and change the way they think. And that, that's extraordinary and very powerful. Thank you. Um, yes.
So the first very, thank God someone's asked this question because I was meant to ask you about 20 minutes ago, which is your record in diversity that's shown on screen, off screen, in your teams. Are, are you proud of it? Do you think you've done enough in that area? I don't, you know, I don't think we've ever done enough. I think that, that it's, a, it's an area where, you know, I look out here and, to be honest, we can all see we're not massively diverse as a sector more generally, and I think we're running to catch up. Everyone's running to catch up. But I think Channel 4 has had an extraordinarily holistic approach to this, on screen, off screen, in terms of the makeup of our team, a whole series of initiatives which have really paid dividends. And, you know, in small ways, we are making a palpable difference. So, you know, tiny things. There was a moment earlier this year when we had a, a fitness show on, which uh, one of the presenters was Amal Latif, who's blind. He's a black, blind adventurer fronting a fitness show on Channel 4 at 8 o'clock. No one said anything about it. No one remarked on it. He wasn't doing a niche program about being disabled or how hard his life was being blind. So in small ways, we're beginning to break this down. And I think that tradition we had, particularly around disability from the Paralympics, of now rolling those presenters out across the whole of the schedule is really, really important. But there's always more to be done, definitely. Talking of talent, um, these are all anonymous, by the way. Anonymous asks, is there any on-air talent you wish you had managed to bring to Channel 4 during your time as controller, and anyone who's turned down an offer? Question. Hmm. I don't think, no, I don't think so, actually. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the talent that anyone in their right mind running a big broadcaster would always want around and deck without a shadow of a doubt. I mean, I, I think they are best in class, and the fact that they consistently win all of those awards feels entirely correct to me. So I think they're best in class. Other than that, no, I, I'm very proud of the fact that we have grown a lot of our new raft of talent. And if you think where Channel 4 was five, six years ago to where we are now, the big faces of Channel 4 are fundamentally different, as John was saying earlier, whether it's Grayson or Guy, we've got a different sort of flavour in the mix, and that feels right. Uh, now, I'm going to ask this question. I, I don't agree with it, but I'm asking it. Yeah. Does naked attraction signal an all-time low for Channel 4? Right, now, I really, you're going to regret asking this because I can get very, very pompous on this subject, uh, so I will do it even faster than I do everything else. Um, I honestly, honestly believe that that is a brilliant example of public service broadcasting. Before you all laugh, uh, I think part of our role as, as the youngest broadcaster is to demystify how people feel about sexuality. And the rollout of pornography across the internet has led to you know, teenage boys going to university impotent because the only female body they've ever seen is a porn star. So do I think there is real value in seeing normal bodies on screen and people understanding that is what it, normal people look like? I think it's got huge value. It delivers a massive young audience for us. And if in a small way we can change some of those debates about body image, then I think we've played a very, very useful part in that discussion. And here's a harsh question, but it's yeah. here. Reports of millions of pounds of advertising leaving Channel 4, yeah. ratings down, ads down. What's yeah. the next year likely to look like for your success? Yeah. Hmm. Well, first of all, ratings come back up again, so that's good news. Um, in terms of advertising, there's, there's nothing we can do about that, to be blunt. I mean, only one of the commercial broadcaster will tell you it is tougher now. You know, there has been uh, a drop-off in the ad market, and yet Channel 4 has survived much worse than this. There's going to be an element of cutting cloth required, absolutely, but that's going to be consistent across the commercial broadcasters. So, you know... I don't want to sound Pollyannaish about it, and as you rightly point out, it won't be for me to solve, but sometimes in my career, I think we've been at our most creative when, you, when you've got less. You have to think very imaginatively about how to work with that. So I think it's a different sort of creative conversation people are going to need to have, but Channel 4 remains extremely well-funded. And this is a good question. Um, the, you haven't managed to find, an, I don't know if anyone has, a kind of regular satire show, satirical comedy show. There's so many great ones in America, you know, I'm thinking of. Um, the Daily Show, that type of thing. It's, you've tried, but it's a hard thing to get right, isn't it? For time? Well, except I, I sort of think we have, and we did it by stealth. I mean, I think 10 o'clock live was a confection where we tried to sort of go ta-da, and it didn't quite land. I think, you know, the best satire show, or thing most closely resembling a satire show on channel f on the on wide broadcasting at the moment is The Last Leg. Right. It's evolved from a show about disability to a show that has said some of the punchiest things about everyone from Putin to Trump that you've heard on British television. So I think... We've got that show, but I know Ed's doing a, a session here and we'll be talking about that again. Of course there's an appetite to be better in that space, but they're, they're hard to find those shows. Rumour has it you're going to Netflix, is this true? Am I? Yeah, Excellent. apparently. <laughs> what does it pay? Very well, I believe. <laughs> they're programmes I think to go by. Um, and is there any gender, gender pay disparity at Channel 4? I think the gender pay thing is a fascinating subject for entirely obvious reasons, but I mean, I, the only intervention I would make is that I have reassured myself that I'm comfortable about where we are. I mean, as a commercial broadcaster, we won't be disclosing that information, but I am happy with where we are. I do also think, as a senior woman, it's important to play experience into all of this. It, 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 I don't think this debate is about saying you're a man, you're a woman, you're paid the same. There need to be gradations within that that are commensurate with someone's experience, and, and that's certainly what we factored in when I looked at it. Brilliant. Those are some fantastic questions. Thank you very much. Before we end, 
let's just look back at your legacy at Channel oh, 4. Oh, God. Let's, let's bathe <laughs> in the glory of Channel 4 over the last okay. few years with this clip. I think it's a good response. You must be happy, you must be happy with that legacy. Yeah, I mean, um, oh, I'm going to say emotional now. Um, that was sent to me to view um, with all the tapes for Edinburgh, and I, I was sitting there on the stairs in my house, and the family were downstairs, and I watched all the tapes, and then it got to that one, and I just burst into tears. So it's weird. It's a sort of um, this is your life type moment, you know. I remember every one of those commissions. I remember every set of overnights. I remember the teams that grafted to land them. I remember the disappointments and and the extraordinary highs. So yeah, it's very moving. And just getting Musharraf to help with his stammer is like, yeah. that's, I mean, that alone is enough to drive it off. That's one of the greatest moments. Um, congratulations, Jay Hunt. Good luck. Thank, thank you so you. much for the session. And thanks also to Broadcast for sponsoring the session. And thank you all for coming and for your brilliant questions. Thank you. Thank you.